the direction we have to take is all to go within ourselves. Single directional. Deeper you go, the closer you will be to your destination. Everything that we are looking for is contained at this time in this small body of ours. So we go deep. The point to go into is a third eye center behind the eyes between the ears. It has been called the seat of thinking. I remember when I was working for the government of India, a VIP from another foreign country came. He had a car accident and he got into a coma. He was in a coma for several days. We were very worried that a foreign dignitary should have an accident in India and might die there. So he was unconscious for a long time. So we tried to get the best doctors from all over the world. We got brain surgeons, neurosurgeons, all kinds of experts. Then we found one surgeon who came who had done more than 1,000 brain surgeries. So he looked at him and he was indicating the depth of the coma. So my boss, who was the chief minister of the state at that time, he asked him, Doctor, what makes a person conscious? And he said, Sir, we have been trying to understand this for thousands of years. And we haven't found out what makes a person conscious. All we know is that there are different parts of the brain in our head. When we try to put a laser beam on different sections, we can identify which is the optic center from where the eyes see which is the oral sector from where we hear. So we can identify where the nerve endings which go to the brain, they operate to create conscious experiences. But we don't know where consciousness is. All we know is if we put a laser beam in the center of the brain where there is a pineal gland and a pituitary body hang just above the medulla oblongata in the center. If we put a laser beam there, a conscious person can become unconscious. So we know there is something hidden there in the center. Now when he was describing this anatomy of our head, I discovered that the point he was mentioning is exactly the point we are talking of as behind the eyes between the ears. So some people think those are vital organs that we have. And maybe that's the seat of the soul. So obviously, the seat of the soul is not a physical thing to be sitting there. <coughs> but it is obvious that when we are alive in the body, consciousness that we know of operates from there. Now when we say consciousness, what do we mean by it? Very often we are using the word consciousness for awareness. A person, we give anesthesia, he becomes unconscious. We can operate on him and he doesn't feel anything on the body. He is unconscious of the body. But does he become unconscious? Not really. He is having some other awareness. Most of the people who undergo surgeries in anesthesia, they come back and tell what they experienced while they were under anesthesia. So, some kind of consciousness continues somewhere else. So th we are confusing the word consciousness with another word we should call awareness. Are you aware of what is happening? That's more a correct term for we are calling consciousness. Then how should we define consciousness? It's best to define it as a potential for awareness. That means if you can become aware of anything, then that potential to become aware of anything is consciousness. Now, now if we think of that, that consciousness is the potential to become awareness, then consciousness can be considered a creative power. Because if it, if it can be aware of anything, it's a very big creative power. The truth is, if we understand consciousness in that sense, we can discover that the whole series of experiences we are describing 
from our true home at the level of the soul, at the level of the mind, the level of the sense perception, level of physical bodies, level of the dreams, they are all merely variants of different types of awarenesses arriving from a single source of consciousness. Understanding consciousness in this way, I began to describe our true home as totality of consciousness. That means everything can be created from there. I said that place must be total. Because if it is not total and something is out of it, then we cannot say it is creating everything because something is out of it. If it is total, totality, if it is totality of consciousness, then we have to admit that what we are seeing here must also be part of that. If this can be separate, that is not total anymore. People define God as perfect. They define that God is perfect. If he is truly perfect and complete, then nothing can be outside of God. That means we are all experiencing God, but in a different awareness. When we say, somebody says, I can go and see God, if you can see God, then that is not God, because then you are separate from God. So you cannot see God, the only thing that you can say to experience God is to be God, to become God, to become total. Now, whatever we, name we give, we are giving these names of the creative power, if we understand scientifically that consciousness is operating and totality of consciousness would contain everything, you can give any name to it. Name doesn't matter. Religions give names. So totality of consciousness must be complete and total. If we think that creation is a dreamlike thing, when we go to sleep, we don't go anywhere. We remain where we were, but we have experience of going far away. Is it possible that the same thing is happening now? That we are really having a deep sleep in our true home and we are having dreams within dreams within dreams of various levels. And when we wake up, we wake up, we never left our true home. And we are always there. If that is so, then it makes sense to say that the dream home where we are trying to go, which is the ultimate our destination, that destination is where we are having the whole experience, including this experience. Is this a, just a, a possible explanation or can we verify this? The most wonderful thing about the following of the teachings of this great master was that we can actually experience that. We can experience that we never left our true home. That all that we are experiencing is taking place in our true home, including the creation of all the universes including the physical universe. So we are going nowhere, except that we have to regain our awareness of a higher and higher experience, ultimately the total experience. The method he teaches of meditation can take us to the experience of the mind. The pull of love that we feel over here, inside, at the causal plane is the same love that pulls us beyond. We are pulling us from, from our own home, our total home, our totality. That is why when we say that love can pull us beyond our mind, we are not talking of something happening from outside at all. It's happening from within ourselves. Then when we see a perfect living master, in a physical form, outside, who are we seeing? Somebody who we created. If everything is illusion, everything is created by us, we have also created the master. A master cannot be more enlightened than one that's out of reality. Therefore, a master is merely a symbolic experience that we have and the inner experience that we are trying to generate it has arranged something of having a master. 
when we understand this properly, we realize that our totality decided to have these experiences and in deciding to have experiences, arranged also that when it was to wake up, it should be able to wake up. This was merely a method of waking up. Somebody suggested to me to see a movie called Inception. Because in that movie, I don't know if any of you have seen it, in Inception, they show that you can have dreams within dreams within dreams. That movie takes one into the third dream. The third dream, the time extends the same way time extends here in real life. So I was very happy to see the movie that it corresponds to my experience that this these big vast experiences in time and space have been generated from small units from where they expand. Same thing is shown in that movie. But in that movie they also show that if you are trapped in very bad circumstances in the dream, you can wake up. So the method of waking up is that before you go to sleep, you keep that little gadget in your hand. Apparently it looked to me like it's something that pricks you. So when you are dreaming, you still have awareness of that gadget which you have. The gadget is used in, in the dream and you can press this and wake up. The truth is that's exactly what we have done here. That when we are tired of a dream, we have made an arrangement to use a gadget which we then use. What is a gadget? The gadget is that when we are here and projecting experiences, we should be able to project an experience which it looks like another human being has come in our life and is going to help us. We call him perfect living master. Our own spiritual arrangement we have made this arrangement before the whole show of creation took place. So that is why, if you understand it from that point of view, then a perfect living master is nothing more than a creation of your own mind, which is the rest of it is creation also of the same mind. One Swami, famous Swami, Swami Vivekanan, he went to America more than 120 years ago. And he went and spoke in a conference that was going on called the World Parliament of Religions. In that, he spoke very forcefully and he explained this is all created from our own mind. The universe is a creation from our own self. It is illusion. He emphasized. It is all created by us. It's illusion. On the second day when he was speaking, he said, I have been emphasizing that the whole world is illusion, then I must also be illusion. Then why am I trying to talk to if I am also illusion, you are also illusion? What are we doing with the reality? He said there is a difference in the illusion we create. The rest of the illusion draws us into the illusion, keeps us more here. This illusion says go within yourself. So the function of the two illusions is different. He explained it the same way that we are now realizing that what we call masters, gurus, perfect living masters, they are symbolic experiences that we get to just wake up. So when we say a perfect living master is operating from all levels of consciousness, it only means that we ourselves are functioning at all levels. Right now we have projected that to get back to that state of wakefulness. So it's a wonderful way to discover when we reach the top, all the answers come to us from there. We discover the whole creation is very different, is created very differently than we thought. The whole creation is taking place in one level, our true home. Everything is happening there, including what we are doing now. It's all a function of consciousness. The consciousness has the ability to be conscious of anything. It has such a beautiful and large power. It can go to vastness of billions of galaxies created. It can go into the microscopic thing, go into the smallest particles. It can create such beauty in its conscious experiences that we are left with no doubt that these such depth of the experience we are having must be real.
That is why I say again and again that the power of consciousness is being used to generate the experience of levels of reality, not of illusion. The level of reality that's being created, but there are several realities. One reality is held up complete and their care has been taken. That the reality, one reality not mix up with the other. In order to sustain the reality of this wakeful experience, we must not at the same time have any other experience of reality. When we go to the level higher above, this reality disappears. We know it was not real. But that reality is the only, only reality then. When we go higher, the higher one is the only reality. This is a beautiful setup that at one time we experience only one reality, not the total. We cannot from any of these realities realize the whole thing. The only place from where we can realize the whole thing that all realities are generating at one real place is our true home. And where it's totality of consciousness, single consciousness. The question does arise, if it's a single consciousness, with all its qualities which are being generated for experiences, what, what is the nature of the single consciousness? Supposing we take seriously a statement made by religion, God is love. I hear it again and again in different places. God is truly love. Okay, let's say our totality is truly love. The ultimate creative power is nothing but love. Some mystics have also given reference to it. We quote Paltu Sahib. Paltu Sahib says, Sahib ke darbar mein keval bhagt pyar. There is only love and devotion in that quote. Nothing else. Let us say God is love. That means there are no souls, there are no mind, no body, nothing. It's all love. Why do we need souls? If God is love. Well, if God is love, God cannot be a lover. God cannot be loved by anybody. There is nobody else. If God is love, love is remains a quality, never becomes an experience. But supposing God within himself says, I am many and one at the same time, God not only remains love, but becomes lover and beloved also. I give example from this glass of water. I say, this is one glass of water. No doubt about it. One glass of water. Now, how many drops are in this water? I can see 1,000 drops of water and I know the size. No, I can now say million. Size has dropped. Now say a trillion. A very small drop. Glass of water is still the same. Have the drops gone anywhere? They are still in the glass. That's the nature of a totality, that the souls, what we say, individual Atman soul has been created. That has been created so that the nature of the totality, which we say is love, becomes an experience of a lover and a beloved. So the interaction of the drops inside can take place with no change at all in the glass of water. That's our truth. When I was very young, Somebody, some people who were on this path, spiritual path, told me the spiritual path consists of our souls have been separated from our destination. We have moved far away. Now we have to struggle through meditation, through following restrictions on our diets, through following stringent measures. And then one day we will go back home and find that was a true home and merge in it. They gave example that our true home is an ocean. An ocean of truth and we are souls, individual drops of that ocean. We have been separated from that ocean for a long time. And now we have to struggle somehow to find where that ocean is and move slowly and slowly through many lifetimes and ultimately go and merge in the ocean. That's how 
द स्पिरिचुअल पाथ फॉर डिस्क्राइब टू मी माय माइंड रिएक्टेड डिफरेंटली टू दिस दिस मेथड ऑफ डिस्क्राइबिंग द स्पिरिचुअल पाथ लुक सो ऑड टू मी लुक सो यूजलेस टू मी आई सेड इफ आई एम ए ड्रॉप ऑफ द ओशन दैट लिटल ड्रॉप ऑफ वॉटर हैज एन आइडेंटिटी द सन शाइन्स ऑन इट it has rainbow color we have a beautiful experience wonderful identity i am a drop they are telling me struggle hard to leave that identity and go and merge in an ocean lose all my identity and the ocean doesn't bother if one more drop has got into it or not he said lose lose game totally i said i i am not going to follow that kind of spiritual path but the description was totally inaccurate the correct description was that i was a drop in the ocean never left the ocean it was just a contraction of awareness to that of a drop the spiritual path was not travel anywhere it was to expand your awareness to the totality and you knew you were always the ocean all the time that made sense to me that you are regaining your own identity you're not losing anything this is exactly what happens really my experiences in life on the spiritual path have shown that there is no journey to be performed we are exactly where we are supposed to go only we have blocked our awareness all these practices we are doing is to expand our awareness to totality and when that happens we discover everything happened in our true home and there was nothing to go but to recover our own awareness into to- totality of consciousness so this is just a way of understanding what it is it's not going anywhere that is why while we are sitting here and and assuming that this world consists of our body and the world around the body that's what we think of that the whole world is there around our body the world we are seeing around our body looks like a physical world everything is physical around here can you ever imagine it looks physical only because we have a physical body suppose we didn't have physical body it won't look physical at all and we know that we have the dream state in the dream is a dream world not this one the dream world comes into being because we have a dream body similarly when we have an astral self or sensory self it's a different world a sensory self where people live differently life is different we have a different experience of the sky for example the sky we see the physical world as darkness at night light in the day because movement of the sun and the planet inside this light is by itself not because of the sun there is light all the time there it's not a very bright light but there light all the time here time flows only in one direction this is bothering lot of scientists today in physics they have come to conclusion after einstein said time space is the same thing time is merely an ordinate of space if that is true that time is merely an ordinate of space it should function like space in space in space i can go there and come back why can't i go to tomorrow and come back to today it's equally possible if we have understood time space correctly then we should be able to move in space i can stand still in time i can't it keeps on moving why is there a difference in this but when we go to the inner sensory plane we discover that we can stop time that we can stand still and everything will stand still with us when we were little children we used to play a game called freeze when somebody shouted freeze everybody had to be still exactly where they were and then when they said unfreeze we could move that's an actual experience in the astral plane that means time is not functioning exactly like it's functioning here what happens when we go higher up we go to the causal plane the mental plane we understand the nature of time completely differently time is not moving at all time is completely static in one go 
All this time has been generated with all laden with events. Several patterns of events have been laden. And we are picking up one pattern and it becomes our life in the physical and astral plane. There we can move on time whichever way we like because it's a movement of our consciousness on time that generates experience. So totally different from what we are having here. And what happens to the sky? It changes its color. It becomes a golden sky. If you see a setting sun, supposing setting sun, it can be easily seen. High sun is too bright. But if you see a setting sun with golden orange color and stretch it all over the sky, that's the sky of the causal plane. Many people in their meditation have accidentally had a glimpse of that. This is all gold light came around us, all golden thing came, we became golden. It's merely a glimpse from the mental state. Our attention can pick up many of these experiences that I am describing. But if you go higher, there is no sky. But there is a completely non-space, non-time awarenesses, which are most amazing. There we discover that what we called the experience of sense perception was an experience of ourself. What we call listening to a sound or seeing light was not listening to a sound or seeing light which came as an experience. It was experience itself that generated the experience. A very big thing, very big thing. When you have your own experience of your own Atma, your own soul, you discover something so different. So these are all different realities. We can see one reality, experience one reality at a time, not all. But when you are at the top, all realities become one. That is why if as a human being, like ourselves, as a human being, we are lucky enough to find a perfect living master who helps us and takes us and we are serious enough to make this inward journey within ourselves and go all the way up. What will happen? What will be the state of a human being who can hold the awarenesses of all these states? A perfect living master is merely a human being like ourselves holding the experience of all the levels of realities at, at the same time. That is why he knows he is ourself. He knows he is separate. He knows he is human. He knows he is near, merely sense perception which we call astral self. He knows merely the mind and the soul and he is a causal self. He knows and is aware of this. Not aware in the sense of memory. Aware in the sense of immediate awareness. Just like we are immediately aware of something which we call our self. Nobody can say we don't know who we ourselves self is. We know we have a self. The self remains the self, same self if you are dreaming, same self when you are awake, same self when you are in the astral plane, same self when you are in the causal plane, same self as a soul, same self as totality. If a definition of reality, really true reality was that which never changes, the only thing that never changes is the self. Everything else changes. Everything is subject to change except the self. The experiencer never changes. The experience changes. So if that is so, you want to see the truth, the ultimate reality, there is no doubt. The ultimate reality is to find that unchanging self, your own self. What we are discussing about meditation, the ability to go within is to go closer and closer to that self which never changes. In the top you find the self was totality itself. Nothing else. We are all part of a single self. But here we think we are all separate selves. The self is still operating in us. How are we having the experience of so many selves? People say if the self, if the God is inside us and we are so many of us, are there so many gods or there one God? One God in all of us. Is he broken himself into small pieces to fit into all of us? Or is he whole? Oh, he is whole. He never broken. How have we 
we are able to accommodate one God unbroken into billions of pieces of people that are sitting here. How is that possible? I remember a few barristers and professors from England once came to see great master. And they asked this question. They said, Master, we are educated people. We have used or trained our minds to understand everything. You sometimes say, mind cannot understand anything. We say, mind, if it is properly trained, can understand everything. Give an example of something that the mind cannot understand. And great master said, do you believe in God? They said, yes, we do. We are Christians. We believe in God. Do you believe in one God or many gods? No, no, no. We are not Hindus. We are Christians. We believe in one God. Okay. Believe in one God. Do you believe when the Bible says the kingdom of God is within, that God is within you? You believe that? Of course we believe that. God is within us. If it is one God, you are ten of you sharing one God. How did you distribute the God to ten of you? If the whole God is there and each one of you is holding the same God, how is it possible? Tell me how you understand this. They said, we haven't thought like that at all. But we believe that at some point we will find there is one God. He says, precisely, your belief system today is not based on your experience. Just the sentence you are speaking, oh, there is one God, there is only one God, and God is inside. It doesn't make sense, your mind cannot understand it. So long as you feel divided, you cannot understand how there can be one God in each one of us complete. Then great master explained that when we are having a dream, and we see 20 people in the dream. And somebody says, this is a dream. Somebody says, how do you know? Looks very real. And you say, no, I know it's a dream. They say that, are we all dreaming? 20 people are dreaming? Which ones of us are dreaming? Are all of us dreaming? You say, that I don't know. Maybe all of us are dreaming. And you wake up. When you wake up, only one person was dreaming. The twenty were part of the dream. They were not twenty dreamers. But till you wake up, you cannot determine who is dreaming. If you want to know who is dreaming in twenty people, two hundred people, two billion people, who is dreaming to create the two hundred people, it's the one who says, who is dreaming and feels the self. I am seeing people I'm dreaming. All the others are dream creatures. If you look at it like that, you will find at every level, there's only one self. The rest are creation, creation of that self. We feel one self, which is our self. The rest is the experience of the self. As you go higher and higher, you discover the self was always one. Not many. It didn't divide at all. Therefore, the whole of totality is continuing to be in the same self. And the creation merely creates bodies, covers, like our cover, like one cover. The number of covers that are created do not divide the self. They divide experiences. They divide ability to feel that the others like us, to make the drama intense, to make this a great show of creation. That's how it is happening. That is why one self remains one self at all levels, at all times. So that self is whatever we experience as our own self. The rest is all created. If you want to find the truth of this drama of one self, go within, go to the top. You discover there was one self, the only single dreamer, dreaming series of dreams, creating dreams of multiplication, dreams of the many. The one and the many are the same. Within our true home, where there is no space and time. We can't describe it. The mind has no capacity to understand anything that is not in time and space. It's limited. Completely limited. 
Sometimes we try to understand things with our mind. The capacity of the mind is at highest level is to think logically, to use the best logic it can, to make sense of things. That's how the mind works. When we want to use logic with the mind, we think. Thoughts all take place in time. You cannot have the smallest thought without time. How can it go to a state of understanding something that's timeless? But there's something else happening in us even now, in consciousness, that is going beyond time. I mentioned God is love and love is timeless, even here. When we experience love for anybody, it's not a thought. It's an instant experience. It is an experience without time, without duration. It's not like a thought at all. Not only love is the only experience we are having, there is another experience we call intuition. What is intuition? Intuition is a gut feeling, a sudden of knowing something without thought. Very often, the opposite of our thought. Where is this coming from? Where is love coming from? If it's not a thought, where is intuition coming from? If it's not a thought, if you understand your own self inside, you will discover there is a division of functions that the mind, which is a level, a mental level, is the one responsible for everything in time, intuition, love, appreciation of beauty, sudden feeling of bliss and joy, they are not part of the mind at all. Thinking cannot generate any of them, nor can it understand anything. So the function of the soul and mind going on simultaneously in our body right now at every level of experience. It does not mean that the soul is now sleeping somewhere and we are functioning here. It's equally functional here. It's functioning along with the mind, along with the senses, along with the body, along with the physical universe around us. So that is why when we want to understand ourselves, we can go much better if we use intuition and love as a source, source of going within. We make use of our mind to make our decisions how to live in this world. How would you like if you were to experiment for a few months to make your decisions intuitively? Not rationally, not thinking, but intuitively. Whatever your gut feeling says, that's a decision. Mind, carry it out. Mind will say, doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't matter, carry it out. If you experiment, do that experiment, what would happen? You will find your life will become totally brilliant and wonderful. You can try it out. You will find it so good, you will make your whole life based upon the right positioning of the soul and the mind. Right positioning of the soul and the mind is the soul has been given a mind to use. Use it. Decision making is not to be given to the mind. Implementation of decision is a function of the mind. If you may live your life based upon the intuitive feelings you get and when you start living on that, every day you will have enough intuitive feeling on every matter of decision making. We are putting the cart before the horse by saying, mind, we make a decision, tell me what I should do. And next day we say, oh, that was not a good decision, sorry. Mind makes decisions based on the data available to it, which is very limited, always. Intuition makes decisions based on lifetimes of data. It just picks up for, for the whole knowledge that we have. Mind looks at what it knows at that time which is very limited. Therefore, we are leading our lives in a very funny way that here we, may, we have been given some wonderful garments to wear, wonderful equipment to use, a wonderful mind that can think, speak, talk, write, communicate, understand, make sense of things, wonderful experiences. We don't use it. We are being used by it. The mind is telling us what to do. We should reverse this position and use the mind how it is intended to be used. 
use the senses to generate more experiences, better experiences of this worldly experience. Use the body effectively too. We were given these gifts to use. Not that we are being used by them, our life is being used by it. Life is supposed to use these things to have a good life. Did we come here merely to suffer here? Why are we suffering? Why are we crying in pain here? We are crying and suffering because we are, first of all, we are taking this as the only reality. And secondly, we are not understanding the function of pain, the function of suffering is to generate a greater degree of feeling of reality. Supposing there was no pain in life at all. Nobody had any emotional pain or physical pain, ever. Nothing would look real. That is why Shakespeare said, there never yet was a philosopher who could bear the toothache patiently. He can give all philosophy lectures, but when he went to dentist's chair and had a toothache, it's real. Pain makes our existence real. He said, it's one of the factors introduced to make this reality, so we can enjoy it as real. Is very well placed. If we take it like that and see that we can use pain and pleasure, we are sitting in a state where it looks that we have more pain and less pleasure. It's not true. The truth is it's very equally divided. The high and the low are very equitably divided, very properly divided in every life. The only thing is that sometimes what is obvious to us, what is tangible, is different from what is intangible. A friend of mine came once to me, not a friend, but just an acquaintance in America. He said, why are you telling everybody that you have to go inside as if this world is no good to live in? Look how my, my life is such, go such a good life. I have a beautiful house, big house. I just bought a new car, beautiful car. I have all the money I need. I am so lucky. I am having a good time. Why should I say that you have to go somewhere? Life is wonderful, beautiful. You should not tell everybody to go there. Some people may be miserable. Tell them. I said, my friend, what I am saying is for the miserable, not for you. Go and enjoy your house. Go and enjoy your car. Enjoy your money. You are very lucky to have this. Enjoy your life. He went away. Next week he was back. And crying. Actual crying. I am the most miserable man in the world. I said, what happened to all the goodies that you had, which made you so happy? In one week it's all gone. What happened? He said, do you know, my wife, whom I loved so much, for whom I sacrificed everything. She ran away with another man. I said, enjoy the house at least. What good is the house? I said, enjoy your money. Money can't buy happiness. I said, your, your talk has changed entirely with one episode. One episode, which I say small episode. There are thousands of episodes that will happen in one life. One episode has completely made your life topsy-turvy. The pain he is feeling is not a tangible pain. It is intangible. Emotional pain is intangible. The goodies he had were tangible. It could be seen. If we look at our own lives, the tangible and intangible, if you combine them, we are all properly placed, well distributed. It is equally distributed pain and pleasure. We just have to look at it the way it is distributed, for what purpose it is distributed. I used to hear about Bhagwan Krishna a lot when I was young. Especially, I was trying to understand this law of karma. And uh, somebody told me the story that Bhagwan Krishna had told Udo, his childhood friend, when they were out with the cows, taking them to graze the cows in the forest, that an ant was crawling on the road. And Krishna says to Udo, Udo, it's not easy to understand karma. We have no idea what karma is. Look at this ant. This ant was at one time 
ब्रह्मा द क्रिएटर ऑफ द यूनिवर्स एट वन टाइम इट ऑल्सो वॉज इन द्रिएट द लॉर्ड ऑफ वन ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट एवल एट बिकॉज ऑफ इज कर्मा बिकम एन एक्ट इफ दीज पीपल हु रन क्रिएट यूनिवर्स दे कैन बिकम एंड हाउ डू वी अंडरस्टैंड इट सो आई वेंट टू गो अराउंड इन द एरिया वेर क्रिश्चन वॉज बॉर्न वेर ही लिव्ड the all the stories about vrindavan what all that area in uttar pradesh i spent time there and i saw very poor people extreme poverty working on land making such a small wage hardly able to survive in the evening sitting together singing with so much happiness on their face i haven't seen amongst the millionaires in america and what were they singing they singing the same refrain that i heard about saying अरे उदो कर्मन की गत न्यारी से उदो द नेचर ऑफ कर्मा इज वेरी स्ट्रेंज इट इज स्ट्रेंज बिकॉज वी हैव सम नोशन दैट दीज एक्शन वी परफॉर्म और द इंटेंशन वी हैव कैन बी वाइप्ड आउट बाय गुड डीड्स कृष्ण एक्सप्लेन दे कैन नॉट बी वाइप्ड आउट यू कैन डू सो मेनी गुड डीड्स टू बिकम ब्रह्म द क्रिएटर बट योर बैड डीड विच मेक्स यू एन एंट विल स्टिल बी देयर there is no atonement we think that we have done something bad we have committed so many sins and therefore now we can go to some priest and say we please find some way to atone our sins and he says give me so much money so much ghee so much atta i will do it and pray for you the prayer he is doing is for himself he gets a good reward and we give all that when we owe him to that from past karma we have cleared some karma of ours but the bad karma we are trying to clear with this method is not being cleared at all you still have to pay for it the law of karma is operating in a very flawless way so that is why karma is so powerful the law of cause and effect that we are experiencing here which is generating every experience this body of human being cannot be born unless the karmic pattern which is to create the body is not complete that's why they say pralab the pehle bani pache bana sharir our destiny was completely formed in advance before even the conception took place which was to be our body so destiny generates the experience which makes the a little embryo in the mother's womb the actual life of the person that comes in a mother's womb does not come till the fifth month of pregnancy a person can be walking outside who is to be born in a woman who is pregnant this is such a powerful force that the destiny of a child to be born <clears throat> is complete and which soul which astral self has to come is determined beforehand so the law of karma operates in a wonderful flawless way some people say that if this is so everything is predetermined yes i agree everything is predetermined <coughs> then should we why should we make decision we can sit at home and say everything is predetermined what will happen will happen why are we making effort to do things well if we look at the chart what is predetermined it says you will make effort and if you say i don't want to make effort the chart pre written says you will say i will not make chart people are thinking that what is predetermined are the actions what is predetermined are the thoughts not action predetermined determination is in the mind and it is the thought process that you will use which is predetermined i got a very strange experience when i was in india and were looking for <coughs> looking for a job i applied for entry into the indian navy i went for interview at lucknow the interview took place and after i came out of the interview i met a gentleman bearded and turbaned gentleman who spoke to me good luck good luck and i said why are you talking good luck we are punjabi we can talk punjabi he said i am talking because you have good luck he said do you have a piece of paper i said yes i was carrying piece of paper he said okay give me a piece of paper and a pen i gave him the paper 
He looked into my eyes and began to write something on it. Then he folded the paper, folded more, made it small, said, hold in your hand. <clears throat> now take out another piece of paper. And now you write a number between 1 and 10. I said, this is an old trick we used to play with as kids. When you say, write between 1 and 10, the number 5 comes automatically. And he's thinking, I am going to write 5. I am going to call off his bluff. So I wrote 3. Then he says, Write the name of a flower. I said, he's thinking I will write rose, gulab, but it's a very common flower. I, I'll write the name of flower which he hasn't heard of because he is in UP. I am from Punjab. So I said, I'll write Chameli. I wrote in English. C-H-A-M-E-L-I. Capital letters. Then he says, write your date of birth. I wrote 1926. He said, that is not your date of birth, that is your year. Write the date. <coughs> now, we always write the date first and the year at the end. But I added the date, November 26, after the year. He said, now open the paper I gave you. I opened the paper. It said, 3, Chameli in capital, 1926 and the date after that. I was completely floored. I said, he hasn't judged my mind. He's not a mind reader. He has been able to read what my mind will think. I hadn't even thought these things, what he has already written. I said, please, how do you do this? He said, shall I tell you something more? He told me. I said, please tell me. I want to understand how one can know in advance what another person is going to think. He said, let me tell you, when I asked you to write between 1 and 3, 1 and 10, <coughs> you said, he thinks I will write 5, I'll call off his bluff and write 3. He repeated my thought. He said, when I asked you to write the name of a flower, you said, he's thinking, I'm going to write rose, gulab, and I'll write a name you never heard of, and he had wrote Chimeli. He knew exactly my thought. A thought that had not taken place at all when he wrote the paper. <coughs> Excuse me. How is it possible? I said, please tell me, how do you do this? He said, we are a small group of people. We are called Bhatras. And Bhatras are reducing in size. Very few are left now. But they are all over the world. You can see in many places, few. We were trained, only our yoga trained us how to read the mind of a person. What is going to happen next five minutes? I said, what does it mean? He says, whatever you are going to think in the next five minutes is already written. First time I saw evidence that what you are going to think and decide, where you say, I will do this or not do this. That's written up. <coughs> Karma is not action. Karma is a pre-record of your thoughts. Pre-record of how you will decide. Pre-record of saying, I don't believe in it, I believe in it. It doesn't matter at all. That is why when we say it's predetermined, everything is predetermined the way we will think and decide, which will still feel we are deciding. <coughs> How do we feel we are deciding? Because of a strange experience we have, which is called free will. What is free will? Free will is that I can decide what will happen the next moment. We can only do that if we are unaware of the next moment. We have been completely blocked from any information about the future. And that's how free will works. If we knew that we are automatons, that we are robots just going by the script already written in the head. You would know it's just already written. We think have, have to think like that. But we are denied the knowledge of the future of our thoughts. Therefore, we feel we have free will. Was it necessary to have this arrangement? 
Was it full knowledge a good thing to have? Not at all. In the human form, we were given free will. There is a blockage of information about the future, ignorance of the future, so that we should think we can decide. And when we think we can decide, we can also decide to try to find God in ourselves. We can become seekers. If we had no free will, we could never be seekers. And seeking is a secret of finding a perfect master. So that is why if you study the whole of creation, how it is placed, it is perfect. The perfection is visible the more you know about the total. In totality, it's all perfect. I'm very happy to once again share all this information with you. I hope it will be useful in your own journey to your own self to discover the truth within yourself. Thank you.